Hello there, this is Al24 News coming up next in our news program. The seventh round of indirect talks between Iran and the United States will end today Friday after days of talks on reviving the 2015 Iran nuclear deal plus. After 16 years as Chancellor of Germany, the Federal Army bid farewell to Angela Merkel with a major military musical performance. And finally, Lebanese Information Minister George Qaddafi resigned to Lebanese President Michel Aoun and Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Miqati today Friday. The seventh round of indirect talks between Iran and the United States will end today Friday after days of talks on reviving the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Negotiations in Vienna aimed at reviving the Iran nuclear deal are set to be suspended Friday so that European diplomats can review proposals by Iran. Ayadi Usama. The seventh round of talks between Iran and the Joint Commission, which includes Germany, France, Britain, Russia and China, takes place this Friday with the aim of reviving the 2015 deal. The talks are meant to set Iran and the United States fully back in the deal. The U.S. former President Donald Trump abandoned the deal in 2018, and the two nations seem pessimistic and chances of reinstating the deal sound low. Iranian negotiators mentioned in the last talk that Iran demanded the removal of all sanctions of the USA and the European Union that have been imposed on Iran since 2017, accusing it of enriching uranium in undeclared areas for weaponry purpose. Iran's Foreign Ministry Deputy Ali Bagiri explained that the USA and its allies should give guarantees that no new sanctions would be imposed in the future. On the Chinese behalf, China's permanent mission in the United Nations tweeted that the USA should lift all the sanctions that they considered inconsistent to the deal of 2015. Antony Blinken on a statement didn't show any optimism over the talks, especially after the last demands of Iran about sanctions removal. As quoted by Iranian media, Hussein Amir Abdel Hayyan, Iranian foreign minister, mentioned that they went to Vienna seeking serious negotiations with a solid determination, but they were not very optimistic about the intention of the United States. This meeting between Iran and the other Poles in a form of indirect talks between Iran and the United States wraps up this week's talks. However, no clear answers can be decisive over the nuclear issue in the region. And to talk more about the latest insights regarding this, I'm joined live by Hamoud Salhe, Professor and Associate Dean of International Education from California, the USA. Well, first, uh, hello and welcome. I would like to ask you in the beginning, hours before wrapping up Iran talks, the latter is giving hints that Iran nuclear deal is excellent as it was uh, put out, even though uh, there are no confirmations uh, that, was, uh, that have been revealed yet. What are your comments? I think uh, the Iranians uh, set uh, the bar very low. That's why they, they were everybody was pessimistic. Uh, but the reason for it is there is a discussion uh, that possibly there will be another round of negotiation. And that might be what the Iranians are referencing to. And it, it is possible uh, that the series negotiation on the technicalities uh, of how the agreement will be proceeded is very interesting. The other thing that we may notice uh, that the Iranians have met uh, with officials from the International Atomic Energy Agency, that is a very, very uh, uh, telling uh, because in the past, particularly in the last round, the Iranians and the International Atomic Energy Ag Agency meeting were able uh, to reach uh, uh, an, uh, an agreement on the removal of the technical restrictions on the services of the equipments uh, uh, that the IAE use uh, to monitor the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, program. What is important about that treaty is that it gives, uh, it allows
the uh, uh, the IE uh, to do the services, but it it allowed the Iranians to maintain uh, the control of the storage of the data, and the Iranians uh, and the IE agreed that the, this, the data will be released uh, once an agreement of lifting sanctions would be reached. The point there is the IE is proceeding uh, from the, what set uh, for a success uh, of Hamad, the ninth of please, the 2015 think, treaty, which think, was to, Do you think that to, this <laughs> Iranian move, sorry just to uh, cut you, but do you think that this Iranian move is going to satisfy the Zionist entity? Oh, definitely not. In fact, this will push them to, to go further by because they have been very, very consistent in, in uh, launching attack on the Iranian or making sure uh, uh, that uh, they are uh, uh, sort of the victims here and uh, depicting a picture uh, that Iran's nuclear program is, in a, is designed uh, specifically against them. And, uh, you know, the Iranian officials, on the other hand, have been very careful and have also issued their threats. And that kind of, that kind of uh, is concern for the Israelis. The other thing behind the scene, you have to understand that the Iran, the Israel might be convinced that the deal somehow, somewhere will be reached. And they want to take advantage of it by getting more support, milita military support for their uh, military arsenal, uh, to put more pressure on the United States. So this is, so this is all part of the plan uh, to give Israel more power, more military strength in, in, the, in the region. And I think, uh, judging by what has been reported in officially, uh, that down the road the deal uh, may be reached, Thank but you. it may not be uh, that we soon. We might take this uh, follow as a follow-up in our upcoming editions. Thank you so much. Hamoud Salhe, Professor and Associate Dean of International Education, you joined us live from California. And now moving on to another story, Russia and U.S. top diplomats met in Sweden amid escalating east-west tensions over Ukraine. The meeting took place on Thursday on the sidelines of a summit of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Stockholm, where foreign ministers from the group's 57 members discussed key regional security issues. Hassan Berkan. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has met his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov as the divide between Moscow and Washington widens over Ukraine. With tens of thousands of Russian troops gathering on Ukraine's borders, Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Vladimir Putin could quickly invade Ukraine for the first time since 2014. The U.S. and its NATO allies warn of harsh economic and political sanctions if he does. The U.S. top diplomat urged Russia to de-escalate the military buildup on its border with Ukraine and reiterated his threat of serious consequences if Russia resorts to aggression. The best way uh, to avert a crisis uh, is through diplomacy. And that's what I look forward to discussing with, uh, with Sergei. But, and again, in the spirit of being uh, clear and candid, uh, which is the best thing to do, uh, if Russia decides to pursue confrontation, uh, there will be serious consequences. For its part, Sergei Lavrov affirmed that Russia will make sure to be heard and that Russia's security doesn't depend on anybody. We will make sure that we are heard. But the main thing is our security. So if the NATO members again avoid talking about this topic or the arrangements that President Putin has put forward, of course we will take measures so that our security, our sovereignty, and our territorial integrity doesn't depend on anybody. Lavrov added also that Moscow is interested in joining efforts with Washington to resolve the Ukrainian crisis. The annual ministerial council chaired by Sweden took place on December the 2nd and the 3rd and aims to review and assess the security situation in the Euro-Atlantic and the Eurasian area and the organization's work in all its fields of activity. The participants include foreign ministers from North America, Europe, and Central Asia. U.S. and EU in a joint press expressed strong concern over China's problematic and unilateral actions in the South and East China Seas and the Taiwan Strait that undermine peace and security in the region and have a direct impact on the security and prosperity of both the United States and European Union. Marwa Belaywar. 
on what is considered to be the second high-level meeting of the United States and European Union dialogue on China. The United States and European Union expressed their concern over what they described as China's problematic and unilateral actions in the South and East China Seas and Taiwan Strait, stressing the need to manage competition and systemic rivalry with Beijing. Beijing has increased its presence in the disputed South China Sea, where several countries have overlapping territorial claims. In one recent confrontation, the Chinese Coast Guard was involved in an incident that blocked two Philippine boats. The joint statement that has been followed in Washington between U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and the Secretary General of the European External Action Stefano Sanino also mentioned that the two sides discussed the repression of China's religious minorities in Xinjiang and Tibet's ethnic erosion of autonomy in Hong Kong. The talks come amid rising tensions between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. U.S. President Joe Biden spoke of the United States' commitment to defend Taiwan after the warning of Chinese President Xi Jinping last month to return to Cold War tensions. Deputy Secretary Sherman and Secretary General Sanino decided to continue meetings in this dialogue at senior official and expert levels, with the next high-level meeting to take place in mid-2022. After 16 years as Chancellor of Germany, the Federal Army bid farewell to Angela Merkel with a major military musical performance. In moments of emotion, Merkel did not hesitate to defend democracy and to fight hatred, violence and misinformation. Hossein Berkan again. German Chancellor Angela Merkel, once described as the leader of the free world, at the time of the rise of the populist leaders in Europe and the United States, is folding nearly 18 years in power, leaving behind a mixed legacy at home and abroad. German Chancellor has called for democracy to be defended against hate, violence and misinformation, and wished good fortune for Olaf Scholz, who will be leading the next government. This came during a military musical show hosted by the German army on Thursday evening, December 2nd, in honor and farewell to Merkel. It is now up to the next government to find answers to the challenges that lie ahead of us and to shape our future. For that, dear Olaf Scholz, I wish you and the German government, led by you, all the very best, good fortune and best of success. I am convinced that we can continue to shape the future well if we don't succumb to discontent, envy and pessimism. But like I said elsewhere three years ago, get to work with joy in our hearts. As the first woman in her country's history, Angela Merkel has held the position of German Chancellor since 2005. She led four governments, managed difficult crises with political wisdom and merit that amazed the world, and she is today the most famous world leader. The first lady who holds the chancellery will also become the first head of the German government to voluntarily step down from power. Many analysts argue that the new government would be very different from Merkel's years as a chancellor. The new coalition, led by Schulz, faced immediate challenges amid the worst outbreak of COVID-19. Europe suffering from the consequences of Britain's exit from the European Union and the border crisis with Belarus due to the presence of thousands of irregular migrants. It's noteworthy that Merkel chose at her farewell party the song of East German bank singer Nina Hagen, the godmother of the German punk music. Austrian Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg announced he is stepping down as leader of his Conservative Party to make space for whoever succeeds him. Just hours after party strongman Sebastian Kurz announced his retirement from politics, Kurz's declaration stunned Austria and created a power vacuum inside his People's Party. After prosecutors started a corruption investigation, he resigned as Chancellor in October at the request of his coalition partner, the Greens, but he remained the party's leader and as a member of parliament. Since taking over from Kurt Schallenberg, a career diplomat has been in the post for less than two months. I'm neither a saint nor a criminal. I'm a human being with strengths and weaknesses, with mistakes and success and everything else that goes with it. When you experience it yourself, it is something draining, something consuming. 
and it has made my own flame a little smaller, at least in me. Germany has announced a lockdown only for the unvaccinated people to fight the spread of the coronavirus, a step that comes while many countries have detected cases of the new variant Omicron. Nabil Khazini. A new lockdown has been announced in Germany. This time, the tighter restrictions are set to be for those who remain unvaccinated against COVID-19. People who are not vaccinated will not be able to access non-essential shops, restaurants or places of cultural leisure, like football games. Unvaccinated people will, however, be able to access essential businesses, such as supermarkets and pharmacies. Germany, following the example of Greece, aims with this step to curb the spread of the coronavirus, especially after the new variant Omicron has been detected in several cities around the world. The decision was taken by Chancellor Angela Merkel, who met with her soon-to-be successor Olaf Scholz and the leaders of the country's 16 regions to discuss plans for further restrictions. Germany's aim was to have 75% of its citizens vaccinated. Up to now, about 69% of Germany's population is fully vaccinated. Vaccination may also become mandatory in Germany by February 2022. Merkel announced that plans for mandatory vaccination have been debated in Parliament and decisions will come soon. A solution that did not please thousands of Germans who went to the streets and protested after prior coronavirus restrictions were announced. It is also expected that more protests will emerge following these announcements as well. Joe Biden's decision to make mandatory vaccination in enterprises with more than 100 employees was overturned by the American court system. A federal court of appeals halted the requirement for employees to be vaccinated on Saturday, November the 6th. This is a major defeat for the White House occupant, who is struggling to persuade his fellow Americans to develop COVID-19 resistance. The first step was to require tens of millions of American workers to get vaccinated against the virus by January the 4th, otherwise they would have been subjected to frequent testing. And for more news about COVID-19 and its new variant Omicron, let's follow this report by Ayedi Osama. COVID-19 new variant is still making its way through the world, as many countries started to expand their measures against the new wave, which created an uproar lately. World Health Organization started working in collaboration with African countries to step up COVID-19 new variant Omicron detection. The organization urged African countries to increase sequencing between 75 and 150 samples weekly. <music> Korean Prime Minister Kim Bo Kyum in a statement announced that people should work from home and avoid going out very frequently as well as banning gatherings of more than six people. In addition, he announced that starting from next Monday, visiting 14 designated public spaces requires vaccine passes. In Germany, major restrictions will take place in the country in the framework of the so-called G2 policies. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said on a statement on Thursday that unvaccinated people are to face exceptional lockdown, which will ban them from going to cultural and recreational venues. Furthermore, German Chancellor stated that the German parliament will consider the mandate of COVID-19 vaccines. Oliver Verin, French health minister, on his last statement concerning the COVID-19 new variant Omicron, stated that his country will face a peak in case rate by late January, explaining that the fourth wave is spreading rapidly, which raises concerns of health officials. Switzerland put 2,000 people in lockdown in Geneva after confirming two cases with the new COVID-19 strain. The two confirmed people with the new variant Omicron were detected in an international school in Geneva. And as an immediate response to the detection, health officials decided to put the students and the school staff in lockdown for 10 days. South African Health Minister Joe Falla stated on Friday that his country has the capability of facing the fourth wave of the pandemic without invoking stricter restrictions, although the pandemic spread in seven of the country's nine states.
The United States joined with international allies to impose new sanctions on Belarus in response to the migrant crisis on the border with Poland and the political repression and ongoing human rights violations committed by the Lukashenko regime. Nabil Khazini. The U.S., the United Kingdom, Canada and the European Union have imposed in a joint statement new sanctions on Belarus accusing the government of Alexander Lukashenko of human rights violations and orchestrating irregular migration at the EU's borders. Council decided to impose restrictive measures on an additional 17 individuals and 11 entities. The decision targets high-ranking political officials of the Lukashenko regime, as well as companies such as Belavia Airlines, hotels and travel agencies that have helped incite and organized illegal border crossings through Belarus to the EU. The U.S. Treasury Department extended sanctions on Minsk by prohibiting transactions and financing of Belarus sovereign debt sold on primary and secondary markets, as well as adding 20 Belarusian individuals, including Lukashenko's second son, and 12 entities to its sanctions list. The U.K. announced sanctions on eight individuals and said it would impose an asset freeze on Belarus Scully, a state-owned potash producer which is major source of revenue for the Belarus government. In Canada, the federal government announced that 24 individuals and seven entities would face sanctions under the Special Economic Measures Act. That aims to be a response to actions taken by the regime of President Alexander Lukashenko. The fresh sanctions come after migrant crisis on the border with Poland have started where thousands of migrants were blocked to enter the European Union. The US, Canada, the UK and the EU accused Lukashenko's regime of politicizing the crisis and violating human rights. France makes its so-called largest ever weapons contract during the two days visit of the French President Emmanuel Macron to the Gulf countries. A manufacturer Dassault Aviation said the UAE is buying the upgraded F-4 version of its multi-role combat aircraft. Marwa Belaywar. French President Emmanuel Macron is in the Emirates on the first stop of a two-day visit to Gulf countries. Macron was greeted at the Leadership Pavilion at Dubai's Expo site for talks with Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, after which they are expected to announce a series of contracts and agreements. France announced multi-billion euro deals to sell Rafale jets and combat helicopters to the United Arab Emirates in order to replace its Mirage 2000 aircraft acquired in the late 1990s, aiming to boost military cooperation with its top ally in Gulf countries amid their shared concerns about Iran. The United Emirates is buying 80 upgraded fighter warplanes in a deal the French Defense Ministry said it's worth 16 billion euros and represents the largest ever French weapons contract for export. It has been also said that the two made another deal concerning 12 Airbus-built combat helicopters. France doesn't really have the huge capacities that other countries have in order to be the United Arab Emirates' main strategic ally. However, it is only aiming to fulfill the gap caused in its economy amid raising tensions between Algeria and its other strategic partners in the African continent. It's worth noting that French officials who told reporters that Macron will continue to push and support the efforts that contribute to the stability of the region from the Mediterranean to the Gulf. They also said Gulf tensions will be discussed, in particular the revived talks about Iran nuclear deal with world powers after President Donald Trump removed the US from the agreement. Gulf countries have long been concerned by Iran's nuclear ambitions and influence across the region particularly in Iraq, Syria and Lebanon. Lebanese Information Minister George Kordahi resigned to Lebanese President Michel Aoun and Lebanese Prime Minister Najib Mikati today, Friday, yielding to diplomatic pressure from Saudi Arabia and its allies. The act coincides with the visit of French President Emmanuel Macron to days golf tour. Sid Islam. Lebanese Information Minister George Kurdai resigned on Friday, easing the way for a possible resolution to a diplomatic crisis between Lebanon and the Gulf countries sparked by critical comments he made about Saudi Arabia's intervention in Yemen's war. 
Kurdai resigned as a result of talks between Lebanese officials and French President Emmanuel Macron on the eve of Macron's planned Gulf tour, which began today. According to sources, Macron may use Kurdai's departure to justify lifting the sanctions against Lebanon during meetings with Saudi officials. However, it is unclear whether the minister's resignation will result in a compromise. Kurdai stated that he initially refused to resign and emphasized that Lebanon does not deserve its current harsh crisis and weakness. Lebanon is a country to be respected. What annoyed me personally, and it bothered the people from different Arabic countries who were supposed to be close to me, is that some of my friends spoke negatively of me. It also bothered me that it affected our relationship with the Gulf negatively and affected the Lebanese immigrants working there. In response to the situation in Yemen, which sparked the diplomatic spat, he said that he hopes people remember that a guy from Lebanon pleaded for the end of the conflict. It's worth mentioning that all Lebanese goods have also been barred from entering Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Foreign Ministry said at the time that the sanctions were not simply in response to the insulting remarks, but also because of the influence of Hezbollah, Lebanon's Iran-backed cheat party and militia. And finally, away from the pandemic, politics and widespread concern about the environment and the economy that have haunted our minds since the pandemic first hit, and as the New Year's approaches, we would like to forget about some precautions from Squid Game to millionaires in space and seek for transformation. War, destruction and calamity have all been mirrored, elaborated upon and imagined in popular culture. But is it necessary to keep going at the same lightning speed? TikTok was founded on weird dancing trends, but millions of people have joined during the pandemic and the short video platform has developed into much, much more. So where does all the dancing go now? The post-pandemic economic fallout was dubbed the She Session. And some women find the gender-specific term belittling and ask the media and economists to stop using it. So that was pretty stressful. While many are still negotiating their survival here on Earth, the Millionaires in Space Boys Club launched their new galactic rocket into space on July 2021. The global supply chain is suffering. Factories have been forced to close, small businesses can't pay for shipping, prices are on the rise, and everything became so pricey, creating shortages in goods. That's all for me and the rest of the team. Please enjoy your evening. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.